，两千零四十四年，并与台湾的姚玉双教授合写一篇论文，题为《原始的佛教：当代的儒家》，从社会学及历史学的角度看慈济。让我们一起来欢迎巩步奇教授为我们讲述慈济。在佛教历史中的定位，个人与利他主义。Let us now welcome Professor Gombridge. Venerable masters, venerable members of the sangha, friends, as we say here, brothers and sisters, I would like first to dedicate this talk to the venerable master Cheng Yan. And also to say how humble I feel, and how much honoured, more than is my deserts, to have been invited to speak on such an important occasion for you. My talk is called "Suchi's Place in the History of Buddhism, Individualism, and Altruism." Today, I want to share with you my concerns about some basic problems about how we should live. I hope that no one will take offence if I say some things which go against tradition. Please believe me when I say that my aim in doing this is to be honest and to promote clear thinking. It is absolutely not to give offence. I believe that though we live in a very unsatisfactory world, full of misfortune, suffering, cruelty, dishonesty, and other evils, mankind does make progress, even if it is erratic and uneven. In today's world, health and nutrition are improving. Even morally, despite much unspeakable evil, there is also progress. Examples of which are the widespread abolition of capital punishment and the vast increase in international humanitarian work carried out by organisations such as Tsuchi, the organisation whose 50th birthday we are here to celebrate. I contend that individualism is greatly to be prized. With this word "individualism," I refer both to a fact, the fact that all of us human beings are individuals with our own needs, rights, and abilities, and to a value that that individuality deserves to be respected. That each of us is valuable. Not because of being a member of some group or class, but just by virtue of being herself or himself. And I'm going to argue that the greatest advance ever made in recognizing the importance of each of us as an individual was made by the Buddha, and that Suchi is perhaps the form of Buddhism which, more than any other in the world today, Has followed the Buddha in this, in recognizing each individual as uniquely important and uniquely valuable. I shall also argue, and this is where I shall be controversial, that in its individualism, Tsuchi has dared to go against the mainstream of Chinese Buddhist tradition. I begin by talking of the Buddha's understanding of karma, individual agency. One cannot understand the Buddha's message properly unless one understands his teaching of, of karma. The word karma is used all over the world, and particularly in Asia, as it has been for very many centuries. But unfortunately, this confuses the issue. For people use it in many meanings, some of them incompatible. The first and basic thing I have to do today is to remind you how the Buddha used the term. 
Karma is a common Indian word meaning act, deed, or action. Although any act I do can be called a karma, for the Buddha, an act is only important or significant if it is intentional. Indeed, karma refers mainly to an action which is performed with a morally good or a morally bad intention. So, for example, merely speaking does not count as karma. But if I say something kind or helpful, I have done good karma. If I use speech to lie or to wound someone, I have done bad karma. Doing good karma makes me a better person and leads to spiritual progress, which may even include a better rebirth. Doing bad karma has the opposite effect. The result of a karma will be seen as a reward or a punishment. That is not entirely wrong, but it is a bit misleading because no one decides on or produces that reward or punishment. That it occurs is, according to the Buddha, just a law of nature which we can compare to a law of physics. The reward or the punishment may arrive through the action of a living being, that is a person or a god, but that it comes at all is an impersonal law of nature like a law of physics. There are some complications, but that is the fundamental teaching. And it means that your karma is entirely your responsibility. The Buddha's teaching was also referred to as the teaching of no soul or no self. Throughout history, this label has led countless people, including many who consider themselves Buddhists, into another serious misunderstanding. The misunderstanding arises from the word soul, which of course is different in every language. What the Buddha was denying was in Sanskrit called Atman, Atman. During the Buddha's lifetime, the most powerful and most organized religion was Brahminism. Brahminism was maintained by a hereditary caste of priests and holy men called Brahmins. Their most sacred teaching was that every living being had at its core an unchanging principle, the Atman. The Atman was, at the same time, the essence of each living creature and the essence of the universe as a whole. This was the one truth that was considered to lie behind the infinite multiplicity of appearances. Enlightenment, and with it, escape from the cycle of rebirth, comes, according to this Brahmin teaching, through realizing that everyone, including oneself, has this unchanging core or essence. Though we living creatures think of ourselves as different, there is ultimately, in Brahminism, one Atman. So ultimately, we are all the same. We have no individuality. If you are hearing of this teaching for the first time, it will probably strike you as very strange and hard to follow. The best I can do to help you is to suggest that you try to think of being as some kind of thing and then realize that being is located in every possible thing in the world, always and everywhere. And yet, in a sense, being remains the same, being. The word being has but one meaning. 
even if it can be used in an infinite variety of contexts and refer to an infinite number of things. If you had rather not think along these lines, let me tell you that the Buddha agreed with you. In his view, there is no such thing as being. And to consider being a thing only leads to confusion. We shall see ourselves and the world much more clearly if we dismiss this idea as mumbo-jumbo, as rubbish. For each of us, our life consists of experience. And we all have different experiences because we all act and behave differently. These actions and experiences differ from individual to individual. We can say, if you like, that they make us what we are. All of us human beings have minds and bodies equipped with sense organs, but every one of us uses them differently, and so has his or her own course through life. Where the Brahmins saw Atman, that is being, in every living thing, the Buddha saw no unchanging essence, but becoming, perpetual change, process. I repeat, the Buddha saw becoming, perpetual change, process. The Buddha didn't deny that I'm someone with a name, Richard Gombrich, and when I, that when I refer to myself, we all know what I mean. But all the components of Richard Gombrich are actions and experiences, an ever-changing flow of processes, even when I'm asleep. I have the label Richard Gombrich until I die. But even then, the processes which make up my biography do not stop. They carry on into another living creature so that we can say that I am reborn as that creature just as before, before I was born as Richard Gombrich, I was born as some other being, and so on, back into the infinite past and on into the infinite future until I put an end to rebirth by attaining enlightenment. Now this takes me back to the beginning of my talk because the most important of my actions are produced by my wish to do good. They will make me a better person until either during this life or later I attain enlightenment. The Buddha himself was reborn innumerable times before his final birth, which was as the Buddha Gotama, also known as Shakyamuni. And many Buddhists study stories of his former lives, stories collected under the name of Jatakas, birth stories. Every living creature has a moral biography of the same kind. There are living beings in the heavens above our world, and in the hells beneath us, and in the world which we humans inhabit, there are all kinds of spirits and animals. But all transmigrate on the same moral principles, and all have the possibility of ultimately attaining enlightenment. This means that even though at a given moment we have different conditions of life, we can change, and ultimately will change. To mention only human beings, male and female, powerful and powerless, rich and poor, are all 
equal in having the same moral potential, the same power to do good and evil. Rules such as king, priest, scavenger are human conventions. But cruelty and violence are always wrong regardless of one's social role. The Buddha said, I quote, not by birth is one a Brahmin or an outcast. One is a Brahmin or an outcast through one's deeds, one's karma. The Buddha's teaching of karma is based on the doctrine that all individuals are true moral agents in the sense that they have free will. Karma thus is opposed to determinism and fatalism. We have responsibility for our lives. We cannot abdicate it. On the other hand, since it is linked to good and bad results for the agent, the universe cannot be random in its benefits, and there must be some kind of law of cosmic justice, as I've already explained. Since one's life is the product of one's own volitions, one's own will, it can come as no surprise that the Buddha clearly states many times that we are the heirs of our own karma. It is we and we alone, each one of us, who build our own futures. Whether we are members of a family, of an organization like a guild or an army, or of a larger unit like a tribe or nation, is totally irrelevant to the operation of this universal law. Chinese Buddhism believes in something which in English is called collective karma, but there is no trace of this idea in the Buddha's teaching. I shall return to this. Once one believes that one may be rewarded or punished for something that one did not do of one's own accord, but was the act of a collective, the Buddha's fundamental teaching of karma as moral causation, the engine which drives good and bad fortune and the very process of rebirth, has been subverted. For if there is even one exception to this universal law, but this universal rule, why should there not be many more exceptions? How can we then be sure that the universe is just and that ultimately we receive only what we have earned for ourselves? It seems that the Chinese must have made this fundamental change in Buddhist doctrine because of the structure of their society, that they receive their personal identity from their membership in patrilineal clans, clans that pass from father to son. I quote Professor Gao Mingxian, forgive my pronunciation, an authority on the Chinese penal code. And he has remarked, I quote, the concept of guilt by association was always very important in ancient Chinese law. As early as the second millennium BC, a criminal's family was punished as harshly as the criminal himself. Over the next thousand years, this principle steadily tightened its grip on the judicial system in his canonical history of China, written around 100 BC, Shima Qian, or Qian perhaps, recorded 
that after Shang Yang ordered changes in the law in about 350 BC, the people were grouped in units of five and ten households, carrying out military surveillance and mutual responsibility for each other's conduct before the law. If a member of one family committed a crime, the other families in that unit were judged to be guilty by association. By the Qin Dynasty, 221 to 206 BC, the principle was applied not only within communities, but also within the army and the government. In the case of minor offenses, the criminal's family would be exterminated to between three and five degrees of association, with serious offenses to nine to 10. Although the virtues of this penal principle were debated at various points in the imperial past, it remained a mainstay of the Chinese judicial code until the Ming and Qing dynasties, that is until 1911, end quote. It is well known that the greatest difficulty that the early Chinese Buddhists faced in following Buddhism was that Confucians attacked them for lacking filial piety. In his book, The Chinese Transformation of Buddhism, Kenneth Chen has a long chapter called Ethical Life. And most of it concerns the Buddhist struggle to show that they were as keen on filial piety as the Confucians. However, the venerable Dr. Guang Xing of the University of Hong Kong, in his article, Buddhist and Confucian Concepts of Filial Piety, a comparative study, has pointed out some interesting contrasts. The Confucian rule is that particularistic ethics, meaning the view that ethical rules can vary according to circumstances and the, the agents involved should be practiced within the family. I quote, if parents and children report each other's misconduct to government officials, then filial piety will collapse. As a result, family, family morality will lose its foundation. When the family is not at peace, the entire society is not at peace because families are the building blocks of a society. Therefore, Confucius said, among us in our part of the country, those who are upright are different from this. The father conceals the misconduct of the son. The son conceals the misconduct of the father. Righteousness is to be found in this. Sometimes killing in order to avenge one's father was pardoned, even praised. I have yet to meet a Chinese Buddhist who did not believe in what is widely called collective karma. Understand, this concept has nothing to do with altruism or, co or cooperation. Collective karma is the idea that one may suffer for a bad deed performed in the past, in this life or a former one, even if one did not commit or even assent to that deed oneself, but was merely a member of a social group, like the family, which contained the personal people who are guilty of doing the wrong. When I say I have yet to meet such a person, I must try to be clear. Once, when giving a lecture to almost 200 people, most of them monastics, at the main monastery of Foguangshan, Gaoxiung, I explained that the idea of collective karma was contrary to the Buddha's teaching. And clearly, the entire audience was shocked. I then had the same reaction from a smaller group at Foguang University. This is a point on which the Buddha's teaching and mainstream Chinese tradition flatly contradict each other. 
and I regard it as of enormous importance because it undermines the Buddha's emphasis on the fact that each of us is an autonomous individual. There is also a very different point of ethics which lies in the same general area. I fear that in making this point, I may, as I warned you at the beginning, upset traditional sentiment. But I think that you have the right to expect me to be honest, even at the cost of saying the kind of thing you might not want to hear. In the article by the Venerable Dr. Guang Xing, to which I've already referred, he says that the Confucian emphasis on filial piety is on children's obligation to their parents. And there is little or no discussion about the responsibilities that parents have towards their children. And Dr. Guang Xing calls this one-way filial piety. Not only do I agree with him, I think he could hardly have made a more important contribution to ethics. It is obvious that all over the world, parents want to have children because they need to have someone to look after them in their old age. There are many other reasons too, but none can be more important than this. As I myself am growing older and weaker, I can fully empathize with this. In Christian countries, the church did charitable work to look after the sick and the old, but of course they could never reach more than a small minority of those in need, and even that only in a small minority of countries. One of the most striking features of modernity is that to some extent, Responsibility for looking after the old and infirm is taken over by the state. This is mainly because mankind all over the world has got so much richer over the last two centuries. There is even a modern invention called the pension, money provided by the state and or former employers. In this context, wealth is truly a great blessing. But as we all know, there is still not nearly enough money to go around, particularly as modern medicine is ensuring that more and more people live beyond the age when they are employable. So children still have a central role to play. Above all, most people become less attractive companions as they age, and as their old friends die off, they have to rely largely on their own children to mitigate their loneliness. No one can deny that parents are responsible for the existence of children, not the other way round. I deduce that most societies have felt uncomfortable with this obvious truth, uncomfortable because they have reformulated the situation by saying that parents have given their children the gift of life. And for this gift, children should make it their chief concern to show their gratitude, a duty so overwhelming that no sacrifice can be too great. I cannot see how anyone can regard this as reasonable. And I suggest that the on, only reason why people have accepted this has been that it is so very easy to indoctrinate children. Of course, once the children are in a position to become parents themselves, it is in their interest to accept this version of affairs. I hope it is clear that I am not for a moment suggesting that people should not care for their parents to the best of their ability. What I am saying, even if it is unpalatable, is that since parents are responsible for the existence of children who come helpless into the world, all the responsibility lies initially with the parent not with the child. 
Incidentally, let us notice that animals work entirely on this principle. At least until the child grows up, the parent is responsible not just for the child's nurture and protection, but also for its education and for doing everything possible to equip it to lead its own life. And to bring children up with a continuous barrage of propaganda, claiming that their first purpose in life must be to obey their parents, is in my view illogical and immoral. It is even likely to be dysfunctional, for to bring up a child with love and encouragement is likely to be more successful at producing an adult who loves and looks after her parents in return than a regime of threats and punishments and a constant assault on the child's innate will to find independence and autonomy. An extension of the ideology of filial piety is the view that the older generation is superior to the younger one. I can't discuss this today. It's a complicated issue. Much less complicated, however, is the issue of ancestor worship. Ancestor worship is, in my view, simply an extension of filial piety and one that does considerable harm. I see nothing intrinsically wrong with studying history, with showing respect to the past and to the achievements of other people's ancestors as well as one's own. But in societies where ancestor worship involves a huge amount of time, effort, and financial expense, it obviously carries a great opportunity cost. As my audience is well aware, this was the central issue which motivated the great Chinese monastic reformer, Tai Xu, 1890 to 1947, when he promoted the reforms which are the origin of the main Buddhist movements in Taiwan today, Tsuchi included. Despite my general opposition to ancestor worship, I do make an exception for Tai Xu, the ancestor to whom contemporary Buddhism owes so much. For his Buddhism for human life has spread across the globe, albeit under the name given to it in 1967 by the Vietnamese Zen monk Thich Nhat Hanh as engaged Buddhism. This name has prompted me to ask in public, what then is unengaged Buddhism supposed to be? My point is that in my view, the main thrust of engaged Buddhism should be seen as an attempt to return Buddhism to something much more like what was intended by its founder, the Buddha himself. Inspired by the social activism of Christian missionaries in China, with their schools, hospitals, and so on, Tai Xu claimed that the Buddhists around him, clergy and laymen alike, were wasting far too much of their time and effort on mortuary rites and devoting to worship of the dead resources which would be far better used to help the living rather than focusing on some putative spirit simply because in life he'd been related to you you should use your own brain to promote human welfare. Only by caring for individuals could you promote the welfare of the entire society in which you lived. Among the great achievements of Tzu Chi is that he discouraged ancestor worship. When my father or uncle dies, sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'll say it again. Among the great achievements of Tsuchi is that it, it discourages ancestor worship. When my father or uncle dies, Buddhism tells us that he will be reborn according to his individual karma. We don't know where. He cannot be two things at once. So he cannot also be a spirit which receives regular offerings and worship from me, perhaps even in inhabiting a shrine in my living room. The belief that my father's or my grandfather's spirit, even though his body is now ashes, has a mind with sentiments which can still respond to my mind, 
while also being reborn elsewhere in a different body with a different mind, clearly contradicts the doctrine of karma and rebirth taught by the Buddha. The idea of surviving ancestral spirits is in historical terms primitive. In India, it long predates the Buddha. In the oldest Indian texts, the Vedas, men, when they die, go to join an undifferentiated group called Pitaras, fathers. Yes, they were all male. Women after death apparently counted for even less than they did in life. The Buddha did something strange to the Pitaras. According to the early texts, there was such a group into which it was possible for men, and indeed women, to be reborn, but only if one had been a very bad person. It was indeed a state of torment, for these spirits, who were like what we might call ghosts, were perpetually tormented by hunger, thirst, and nakedness. Their living descendants tried literally to give them food and drink, and also at the same time to transfer merit to them, so that they could die as ghosts and be reborn in some less wretched state. In my opinion, the Buddha was here, as in many other cases, satirizing the Brahminical religion of his day, not propounding a serious metaphysical doctrine. He was, in fact, ridiculing a widespread belief which did not regard people as true individuals, but only as members of a family line, a patrilineage. The importance of lineage in Chinese society has carried over into the practice of Chinese Buddhism. The monk who tonsures a young man and thus admits him into the Sangha occupies a position analogous to that of his father in lay life, and those monks who have been tonsured by the same master are forever, forevermore, his brothers. The Buddha did construct the life of the Sangha to some extent on the model of the family, just as Tzu Chi does. For the Buddha, it was a middle way between normal lay life and the life of the solitary ascetic who totally renounced society, including anything that resembled family life. Theravada Buddhism has maintained the tradition that the head of one's monastery is like one's father and one's fellow monks are like one's brothers, and this gives the individual emotional support. But the family model is not carried nearly so far as in China. For example, it is unthinkable that a senior monk could be regarded as a peta, as an ancestral spirit after death. Nor is the history of Buddhism in a Theravada country thought of in terms of lineages. I shall now conclude, as my title promises, by saying a bit more about Tzu Chi, about individualism and altruism. First, I must make one thing absolutely clear. Individualism does not mean selfishness or self-centeredness. In some early Mahayana texts, other Buddhists are criticized on the grounds that each of them only strives for his own salvation to reach nirvana. I have shown in my publications that this criticism is completely unjust, that the Buddha taught that the way to attain nirvana was to develop infinite love, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. He called these the four divine states. He himself, on attaining enlightenment, considered that he might spend the rest of his life enjoying the bliss he had discovered. But instead, he decided to stay in the world and teach so as to enable others to learn from him and follow him. Each individual was responsible for his own spiritual progress, and that involved showing the truth to others. On this basis, the Buddha founded the Sangha, who were told to be missionaries devoting their lives, like him, to spreading the Buddha's message. Thus, to care only for oneself is to waste one's life and the opportunity to do good, and either to attain the bliss of enlightenment or at least to make progress towards it. Tzu Chi is firmly based 
on this essential teaching of the Buddhas and asks people not to waste their lives. Tzu-Chi has discarded some major traditions. It prescribes no fixed view of what happens to us after death, but discards, discards the cult of ancestors. We do not know what awaits the dead, but we do know suffering when it is before our eyes. So Tzu-Chi puts its efforts into disaster relief and into medicine. It believes in our responsibility to the young, so it cherishes young people and puts resources into children's education. It offers the master love, admiration, and respect, but tries to operate in an egalitarian spirit, which allows each individual to be honored for his or her own contribution. Just as the Buddha refused to treat anyone on the basis of their gender, their wealth, caste, or social prestige, so Tsuchi is equally kind to all. It ignores such divisive factors as nationality and does not even mind whether people call themselves Buddhists. Like the Buddha, and unlike most major religions, it does not reject anyone for their opinions and has no concept of heresy. What counts is what you do. Your individual karma. Its stress on individual responsibility is particularly clear in its mode of dispensing charity. It tries to avoid operating through impersonal agencies so that identifiable, in, identifiable individuals make the donations and similarly they are made to individuals. The crowning touch is that the giver thanks the recipient for accepting the gift so that the transaction will benefit both. Finally, and possibly most important of all, Tzu-Chi believes and shows by example that the only way forward for human society is deliberate cooperation.